Hello everyone. Hello everyone! Welcome! Welcome, Welcome back to Indie 3. Uh, on the other line, or on the line right now, we have a Danny Garfield, who is the creator of Concursion. Hello! You can, you might be able to hear just a little bit of feedback uh, from that side. No idea what's Working happening. Working on it. We've been spending the last 20 minutes kind of playing audio game, uh, like you do. Uh, but I want to thank you guys all for hanging out with us, and I want to show you guys a little bit of Concursion right now. You got me, got me, James? There we go. That's what I needed. Thank you, James. Hold on. Oh. I'm holding on. By the way, this is uh, Uba Games is the name of the company that uh, Danny runs. All right, roll it. You got it, boss. Is concursion now out on Steam? Uh, Danny, are you there? Yes, sir, right here. So it seems like you pl you worked through all of the oh. tutorials of any game development platform, <laughs> and you were like, you know what? All together now, and you orchestrated yep. concursion. How did that come about? You know, um, I wanted to do a game that I felt like I hadn't played before, and I'm a really big fan of like the high-speed, tightly controlled, challenging uh, platformer. Like I, I bleed Mega Man, and so um, you know, I just thought, how much fun would it be? Uh, what could you do if you jump from genre to genre on the fly? What kind of ridiculous gymnastics and acrobatics could you pull off? And um, what could you do that wouldn't be possible within uh, one game on its own? And so this kind of was born. Wow. So, I mean, maybe this is a big question for being like one minute into the interview, but what have you found that's kind of like a consistent theme between all of these different modes of play, if anything? You know, I, I think I really did. Um, try to keep all of the different genres oriented such that you were trying to get from like a start to a finish. You know, it's all goal oriented. It's really high speed. And so um, really it comes together in such a seamless manner that the idea is like, I, I like to describe or I like to really to execute more. Uh, you know, you sprint as kind of a Mario-like character. You take a jump into like a floating circle of a Ninja Gaiden space. You take a double jump in that area, and then you kind of use your jetpack to thrust off in the horizon, all in kind of totally fluid motion. And so the commonality between them for me was really um, that we find a handful of genres that all do work together, all in the 2D space, that share the same kind of goal aesthetic so that you could remap your controller on the fly without completely melting down the brain of the player. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well... I'm I'm kind of imagining this game design document that you've developed in my head that's like, we're going to do everything. Uh, how did you go about like organizing how you're going to pace all of these things while still maintaining this flow? Sure. Uh, well, first thing we started with was drawing like a lot of doodles, kind of line work about what kind of shape do you make if you jump in the air and then bend that jump to the left in mid-jump? What kind... What kind of jump does a double jump look like if you do the same kind of motion? And then kind of started stitching them together, literally just sliding them into place to see 
what kind of interesting new additional tricks you could do in this format that you couldn't do in the games on their own. And so um, a big part of it, especially you mentioned that kind of design doc, was to figure out a format where we could kind of just pick the four arrow buttons, an A and a B button, no more buttons than that, but still do a tremendous amount of different um, acrobatic activity. And so, again, furthermore, uh, the idea of having to not learn six different games at once was really important in that, as you can imagine, we could do like tutorial game one, tutorial game two, game three, you could be five hours in and just kind of doing every game's level one. And so instead, it was really important that we find kind of genres that you could look at and immediately understand, oh, this is Mario, for lack of a better. This is Ninja Gaiden Gradius. I get this. I don't need a tutorial that much. Mm -hmm. so, oh, so you're, you're pulling from uh, the kind of gamer ecosystem of design to make a, a larger form. Exactly. It's definitely a game for gamers. We, we rely very hard on the fact that... Um, the people we think will enjoy our game the most are, are likely to understand what they're getting into, be able to kind of look at a bright blue sky, puffy white clouds, and in an instant know like, okay, I jump on these beds. Mm -hmm. And if I have a sword, then I can probably, you know, grab a wall too, things like that. And I, I want to give some props because uh, for, for the kind of like audience that you're working with, uh, because these games and the forms that they take and all of the ways that they look and how you've kind of pulled concursion together uh while it does kind of uh it, it resonates with that that gamer type circle um all of these games are arcade games and during the 80s the arcades were a huge hit with uh, a wide wide variety of audiences not just uh not just young men and so uh there's so much going on in that that uh i think you can identify with so many different people yeah, thanks. Hey, Thank I'm sorry. I need to jump in here. We have had a network dropout, so oh no, I know, right? Oop. So oh, I'm gonna was... I'm gonna restart the stream and uh, let's give that just a moment. Okay. When we come back. We'll talk about arcade stuff. Oh no! Please don't crash. <laughs> no. Upside, it's still recording on our end. Oh yeah. Oh. The uh, well. That version of it. Sort of. <laughs> oh. Okay, uh, all right. Ah, oh, this game is so cool. Let's try again. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, we're, we're going live now. All right. Okay. Hmm. Hello, universe. All right, I've muted the broadcast. Just going to see. I'm blaming Comcast for this one. Ooh. Oh, what's oh. it? Wait, let's check on Indy 4 then. Uh, Can I go check real quick? <laughs> Please do. Yeah. Please do. Mike is still hot. Okay. Hello, Ski? Hmm? Hi! No, hold on one moment. Sure. Yeah. Uh, looks right, like I'm things back. are stabilizing some. So I'm going to give that, like, 30 seconds more, and then if we're still in the green, I will take us back live. Cool. Oh, no, we're back in the orange and the red. Yeah. No. It's just flashing like a stoplight. Yep. It's like red light, green light, though. You have to like take two steps forward whenever it looks away. Yeah, we'll just start and stop the stream. <laughs> yeah, let's see.
Yeah, we released on Friday, and uh, it's pretty exciting. We're coming out. Wait, at, what? I, what was that? <laughs> I found a video of Danny. Oh, I see. Of <laughs> me. I, I was Talking very confused. confused. I All see right. you, cutie. Oh, hi. Uh, gonna try talking to a different server. Yeah, screw LA. I know, yeah. right? That's Those my guys general, can go to hell. That's my general philosophy in life. Screw LA. But but you're I'm probably in, on the San Fran server. There's a reason I'm in Seattle. <laughs> oh. No, you're probably on the San Francisco oh. server, and that's why it didn't work. I, oh, wow. I don't know how his server is a do. Nah, just anything from San Francisco. It's not going to work. <laughs> they might play some great defense, but they won't be able to back it up with anything. Oh, wah, wah. I don't know where Encino is in relation to California, but oh, it's it's L.A. right okay. in the valley. <laughs> good, good. Then I'm safe. Uh, yes, I'm gonna contact the hitbox guys. Go Chargers. Woo woo. And Padres. Padre. Doyers. Oh. Um. <laughs> oh, I'm a, uh, aren't Padres are they the baseball team in San Diego? Yeah. Okay. Whew. That hasn't changed. I know nothing about baseball. I was gonna say I'm very sport. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Oh, to, interesting. Okay, I forced to reconnect to the West Coast server, and it looks clean <laughs> now. So let's try. All right. All right. I'm gonna take us back up in five, four, three, two. Hi, we're back, hey, everyone. We're back. Sorry about the downtime. Uh, servers just kind of crapped out on us. So we're playing. We're really Comcast. angry. The angry God servers. <laughs> Uh, but we're here with Danny Garfield, uh, the creator of Concursion. Oh, excuse me, I have a hiccup. And uh, <laughs> yeah, Danny Garfield, and we're talking about his game Concursion. Um, were we able to? We showed the trailer. Yes. Game for me in like that all worked. Big way, like the game. Uh, <laughs> sorry, we've got Danny right there. Hey, Danny, you're on the stream. I see me. Well, yeah. I don't see me. I hear me. <laughs> uh, no, I do see me. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da. <laughs> Uh, um, oh, man. There we go. We can F11 it, too. Um, so, um, <laughs> I just did the... <laughs> um, so, what we were talking about before we got cut off by uh, the cruel servers and, and Comcast, Comcast, we were talking about oh. arcades. We were talking about the influence of arcade design on Concursion. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, a good place to go is how does arcade style design influence concursion and how does it work with contemporary design? And what do you think about that? that that's a really interesting question because definitely the design of an arcade game is so very different in terms of like the, the goals to be achieved from a mm -hmm. modern game. Exactly. Obviously, you know, in a, an arcade, even the best of players it has to be forced to pay a quarter every 20 minutes at least, something like that. And so, you know, you're expected to die or have a level limit or a life limit, rather, of some. Mm -hmm. And so capturing that kind of frantic nature um, definitely, I think, especially spills into, like, the Nintendo and, and then even the Super Nintendo era where you try to capture those same sorts of gameplay, simple and clean and, you know, straightforward play. And I think it took a while to learn that um, it was okay if the player didn't die all the time. And it was okay yeah. if uh, you were allowed to live for 20 minutes. So, um, yeah, what we try to do... Is Kind of capture that uh, nature of arcade play really fast, really simple, easy to learn and pick up. 
and and then are arguably you know difficult to master but um you know to not do limited lives and i think that's something that recent games have been doing that i'm personally a big fan of the game is hard cool but you know be able to start again immediately. There's no joy in losing your progress. There's no reason to cap level, or rather, number of lives. Things, and um, between all those different facets, you can have a game that um, might be really challenging, maybe not really, really frustrating. So we're looking at it right now, and it, there's a lot of different ways to play it, or there's a lot of different modes to play. Definitely, yeah. We've got um, five primary different gameplay types, which actually comes along with five different art styles and five different uh, renditions of the soundtrack. Um, and then our bosses provide just their opportunities to explore uh, 2D genres that maybe couldn't seamlessly work in the player's control, because you can imagine jumping from, say, uh, Mario to Gr Gradius to Ninja Gaiden, but if you were to jump from any of those into, say, like a Japanese RPG, you can imagine that clamping down the screen and getting menu-driven might be a real killer in the action momentum. And so uh, we do that in bosses instead. <laughs> really? Well, so for example, our, uh, our third boss is actually a trio of JRPG heroes, a white mage, a black mage, and a fighter. And they're constrained to use um, turn-based menus. You can actually see them making options, fight, magic, item on their screen in real time. But you as the player uh, play as our uh, hack and slash ninja character. And so you get to weave between their attack patterns in real time on the fly, trying to sneak sword slashes in whenever they're not taking an aggressive turn, things like that. Wow. So I'm as I'm seeing it kind of lay out, uh, you have a bunch of different systems going on. You don't just stick to the five and uh, design around that. Whenever you need some other new kind of expression, you throw it in there. Exactly right. And so one, one way that we were able to kind of do that, that, that I'm a fan of, is every enemy in the game has a one-to-one -one relationship with another enemy in another game. So, for example, a spaceship that flies its way out of our space shoot 'em up game and into, say, our platformer might turn into a dragon, fall to the ground, and kind of be waiting to get its head jumped. Oh. And so, like, tying those patterns together becomes so much more interesting than a single monster's pattern on its own. Um, one of my favorite is a level called Shot Pursuit. And um, there's these heat-seeking, almost if you can think of the masks from Mario 2 that just chase you relentlessly. Uh -huh. And they do chase you on, like, top and bottom of the screen. A vertical, or rather a horizontal stripe right through the middle of the screen is our space shoot 'em up game. And when they enter that space, they become kind of a brainless, uh, indestructible meteor. And so if you can imagine this like figure eight shoelace tying shape, every time they're on the outside, they kind of regain their intelligence and they twist around to track you again. Every time they pass through the middle, they're an asteroid and they go flying through space again. And so in that way, they, we kind of can create really interesting attack patterns with seemingly simple enemies. Wow, so there's multiple layers that are all working together based on the designs of uh, lots and lots, lots of other of styles of games. And it just kind of all comes together, all comes together so, so elegantly. Thank you. It's very uh, nice of you. I'm just wondering, uh, like, how? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. Uh, like, do you want me to get tech and nerdy about it? I'm happy please, to. Please. Okay. Well, so um, it's probably easiest to describe from the point of view of, like, our level editor. So to make all of our levels, we did make an in-house level editor. And so the first thing we do is kind of literally um, paint paint the level with which dimension um, a box of space is supposed to be. So if you can imagine, like, I'm going to draw a circle of hack and slash here. I'm going to draw a rectangle of platformer here. I'm going to paint the entire background with a shoot 'em up And then what we do, instead of in, in, say, Mario, you would place a Goomba, you'd place a Koopa, you'd place a Spiny. In our game, we, we consider them all shiftables. So, like, a shiftable is a grab bag of five different enemies in one. And so, like, our grunt shiftable is a Goomba, depending on the spotlight, spotlight that's you know, flat shining on it. If some other spotlight shining on it, it might be a spaceship, it might be a samurai, it might be um, a minotaur in our maze. And so each of the enemies we plant is actually like a five-way multifaceted enemy that will change its behavior based on the spotlight landing on it. And so, um, yeah, it can get really complicated building levels. You know, it's not good enough to just put this lizardling here and count on him being able to jump on him. But um, if he makes his way later and walks into a shining spotlight column of hack and slash, He's going to turn into a samurai, and we need to set, you know, his speed and his activity for that as well. So, wow, you're, as the player especially, you are manipulating uh, where you are in Bar. relation to the world around, world you, around you, and also so, uh, where your enemies will place themselves based on their specific AI. 
Exactly. And then as the game goes on in later levels, the boundaries between these levels actually start to move. So if you can imagine, you know, riding a sea of a jetpack, or rather riding a bubble of a jetpack game over a sea of spikes, that's for hack and slash, that, that your ninja would have no way to cross on its own. As the game gets later, actually, if you can imagine, um, dimensional bubbles themselves will fragment even smaller and chase and pursue you. They might even get thrown by enemies at you. So imagine playing Gradius, like a space shoot 'em up and an enemy's throwing spotlight bubbles of, say, Mario at you. Of course, if one hits you, you're not a spaceship anymore. You're a dude. You don't have engines. You plummet. And the bottom now works as a cliff, as it would in that genre. And so um, there's an example of a boss we have who actually flings dimensional barriers at you for you to deal with. Uh, they might summon, you know, sh breakable walls, but along with it comes, um, you know, our, our bullet hellish shooter. They might throw, um, you know, a swath of jetpack at you with some really complicated mazes to work through in kind of a forced, forced camera perspective. But every time between those attacks, it'll return back to kind of the uh, platformer style neutral. Wow. I, I mean, I'm just speechless because like all of these parts have to come together seamlessly. Uh, the, the thing that you are manipulating in a weird way is you, like when you're saying that a boss is just kind of throwing these spaces that you, they're like literally constructions of play spaces being thrown like space itself space. <laughs> is being thrown within this, like in in not even a metaphorical sense, like a very literal idea. Uh, play is being space. thrown at thrown you, and at you have you. to be you are affected, by, affected that. by that. Exactly right. Like, and it's, it's actually <laughs> it's really interesting, uh, or rather, like I almost feel sorry for um, our our composer is a friend of mine, Chris uh, Christopher, mm -hmm. who I've known for a very long time, and, and we're kind of lucky in that he's an actually Emmy nominated composer, but really just you know a long time friend. That kind of brought him this idea of, do you think you do a soundtrack for a video game, but every song of the soundtrack, could you do it in five styles? And so the whole soundtrack kind of crossfades as you play. If you're sitting in the kind of platformer space, the music is very Saturday morning cartoon. But as you walk closer and closer to some hack and slash space, it kind of picks up these heavy guitar elements. As you walk into, say, our kind of Pac-Man mini tours maze, it gets chip tune. It can get electronic. It can get this kind of ambient uh, light uh, atmospheric track. But of course, usually, especially in the latter levels, enemies are throwing all sorts of bubbles at you, and you know you're jumping from bubble to bubble on the fly without ever touching the ground, and so it kind of becomes a full orchestra at once. So I kind of like, hey, Chris, think you could do a million songs that can play on top of each other and stay in sync? Oh my gosh, that had to. I mean, that has to be has hell to, to code <laughs> or pro or construct or conduct in some way. I you. Just, <laughs> fun coding is fun that's 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 oh, why that's i'm an indie dev <laughs> um i just i kind of want to keep on with this this theme of understanding each of these as as play spaces and understanding how many layers, oh, layers go into navigating, navigating each of these spaces, spaces on the fly, on the fly. um because each of these is going to have the song that you talked about the uh background the graphics Optics. that mm -hmm. are involved in that and that's shifting uh, so yep. each object uh, that goes into these spaces, spaces or even the space itself as self. an object is navigating and like all of these layers all are these so layers. dynamic and uh, it's <laughs> breaking my head. Yeah, it's good times. But uh, I guess, I mean, my question that I'm, I'm kind of just tripping over and over is um, how do you throw, do space, you throw space, around? space around? Well, sure. So I guess... It's probably easiest to think of um, maybe in the way that our code does. Um, we've got kind of two parallel systems. Mm -hmm. um, we've got, you know, a normal game would have the physics, which, you know, controls where you move and gravity and things like that and what happens when things impact each other. Um, and we took some core components of that physics system and basically gutted them out into separate blocks that could be replaced. And so, for example, the, the value of gravity, you know, our jetpack space, you plummet very slowly, whereas our hack and slash game, you drop like a brick. Mm -hmm. uh, but bricks drop the same speed as feathers, so hot. No, um, you know, um, so we took things like, you know, gravity and uh, what the controller does and what the behavior of the enemy is and kind of extracted them from the core system. Then we have this parallels kind of separate layer that also runs in the same geometry, but completely separate from physics. And that's, we call them our dimensional bubbles. And, and they're, you know, bubbles, regardless of if they're gigantic and take up the whole world or whether they're a small circular bubble that's getting thrown at you. Mm -hmm. and they or kind a of, wall or... Yeah. Any other kinds of shapes they could make. Exactly. And so um, 
they kind of fill in those gaps in the primary physics framework that we built. So if the primary framework doesn't know things like gravity or what a button does, then the bubbles kind of answer those questions. And so every time, you know, every frame of action when our dragonling is going to take one step forward, you know, in a normal game it would go, okay, I'm on to drop by gravity and take a step forward. In this case, it goes, I'm going to drop by, hey, bubble, which gravity should I adhere to because you know what dimension I currently am? And what should I do? Is it a step or should I hit my thrusters? Wow. That's... Wow. Okay. Cool. So, so I got to ask, level design must be a riot, right? right. It's fun. Oh, man. The like, first day, we came up with like a grab bag, like a spreadsheet, actually, of 60 level ideas. And I'd, I'd say almost two-thirds of them got done. But along the way, we kind of had ideas like, well, hold on. What if we had like switches and you could turn on and off, on and off dimensionality? What if you could like create your own path? What if, um, you know, these switches had timers and you had to like turn a giant sea of spikes into jetpack space that you could fly carefully across? But if you don't make it in time, it turns back to jetpack gravity, takes hold, you plummet, things like that. And so, yeah, as we go on, the more and more we played with, you know, the game system and the ideas behind it, the more it just exposed how many additional opportunities were to do ridiculous things. Like I'll throw out one of my favorite levels. Um, mm -hmm. It's actually, I'm going to spoil it, but I still really love the level. One of the last levels of the game, um, it occurred to me... Exclusive. Indeed, it is. Um, one, of, one of the last levels, it occurred to me, like, all of the, f the final act, every level has kind of a weird standalone twist on our system. And so one of the levels is actually, what if every time you're facing to the right, you're a platformer, and if you ever face to the left, you have hack and slash? Well, that's really cool. It means you can leap out to the right over a giant gorge, take a double, double jump back to the left, but not back to the right, things like that. And so like the jumping puzzles we can create, like you can bounce your way over a bunch of enemies to the right, but you can only double jump to the left. You can grab walls on the left of you, but you can only, you know, cross a big long jump on the right. And so it's crazy, but it's, I think it's so much fun once you like get a grasp of it to like just do these gymnastics. How do players manage? Do, they, do their heads just explode halfway through? I've literally seen one person's head explode in front of me, and I felt really, really bad. Like, I didn't know <laughs> how to react. You don't see that thing every day. You're just like, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, ooh, we should, this. let's not put this game out. <laughs> Too late. Well, no, Even Steam um, loved it. it you know, was. it's um, it's challenging, like especially for our demo, like how do players pick it up. Mm -hmm. For our demo, we wanted to do just a few levels, and we wanted to show off all the craziness but we also wanted people to be able to play it yeah and so um you know the game proper i think you know act one introduces each of the genres and starts having you jump between them act two starts to ask for gymnastics across them act three enemies start to become sometimes immune to dimensional effects and they can like a spaceship will fly out into your platformer and stay a spaceship things like that act four bubbles start to move then they start to move intelligently then enemies start to use them against you and so like it's a really slow climb but that was also really nice because there's so much to explore that um, kind of every level one by one allowed us to introduce completely like a new and different idea. And it was really important to me that like when we built our idea, our, uh, our levels, that every level indeed has kind of a standalone thesis and like it has an idea and explores that intentionally. That's a brilliant way to escalate things uh, without, I guess, being overbearing. I think the most amazing part is that you're kind of giving sentience, sentience. to so many, so many different ideas different. Uh, in each of these acts, right? You have like, all right, you are a person and you can do all of these things. And then like, all right, enemies are also uh, their own things and can do all of these different all things. And then the world itself, the world itself is a very vital organism within this entire, entire ecosystem, ecosystem of the game. And it can do all these different all things. 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 And then how do mm -hmm. those work together? And so, yeah, you can, yeah. You can get chased by an enemy and have no means to fight it, but also be chased by a spotlight of dimensionality, which might give you a sword to deal with that enemy chasing you. Yeah, like you said, every, every bit of the game has some life. Yeah, it's just so vital in how it plays out. Uh, that sounds amazing. Thank you. Um, oh, do you want to say something more? I'll, I'll, I'll ramble all day. I have no problem filling up all the days, all the hours of the day. <laughs> well, we've got three more days, so keep going. All right. Yeah, I mean... Um, I don't know, I'm just really excited for people to give it a shot and, and like give us feedback, you know, especially some of the bosses I love, um, you know, fighting a gigantic dragon breathing fire on you and eventually he brings down this giant crusher from above to smash you in platformer space and you've been kind of playing on these islands suspended over lava. So right as the crusher comes down, the lava recedes 
jump into those lava pits and find out that it's actually fully submerged Pac-Man like maze, things like that. And so I'm just, <laughs> I'm just stoked for people to try this stuff and then just see what people think. Because they get to explore it, right? And so they get yeah. all these surprises as it comes by. Exactly. I think at one point I was promised dancing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so every level ends um, with – we wanted to really figure out how to end our levels in, in a really intentional way. And we are talking, you know, marathon goal lines or like a lamppost or anything. In the end, it just had to be an additional gameplay dimension. I, I used to play so much Dance Dance Revolution. I love DDR. And so that, that became the final win dimension. Your goal at the end of every level is to find the, uh, the disco dance dimension and uh, bust a move to win. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, now I have to do this. I have to like play this whole thing. You know, I'm not on camera, but you are. Do you want to show everyone to dance f from you? Um, can I? <laughs> on the spot. Can I show the dance video? Oh, I, I don't have a video, but I was saying you should probably dance. Oh, just just straight boogie it out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Danny. <laughs> no problem. I already did. Um. I had a question about development. So this is out on Steam now, mm -hmm. which means you survived. Eek. Terrifying. Yeah. So you, you, you survived and you met the win condition of the Steam hustle. Indeed. Um, and so I want to know about development and how, how long did it take long to make such a... It seems like a very like ambitious very project. Yeah. Um, it took us just slightly over a year. Just about 13 months. Um, just about a year ago... Um, myself, it's, it's just a team of three. It's I'm the programmer and I guess the uh, concept designer for the game. Um, and then I have two gents named uh, Dave who work with me and uh, sound effects and art cleanup and QC and uh, a whole lot of ton of production stuff. Um, both the Daves do. But yeah, about a year ago, we were all working kind of grown up full time jobs doing um, work for the movie studios like games and apps and things for post production. And I just really wanted to take a big dumb gamble and see what we could make. And so um, I kind of picked the language, uh, programming language I was just most familiar with at the time. Didn't want to brush up and just wanted to dive in the deep end and see if we could do this. So I remember like a distinctive moment where I kind of looked at um, Dave who joined me right off the bat. I said like, just so you know, like I think I can do this, but there's a pretty decent chance that in two months, like I'm just really, really sorry. But uh, luckily that didn't happen. So uh, we got, yeah, we got here to the end. And I'm just, one of my biggest goals was just to make something we were, I was happy with. And I really think we got there. Wow. That's such a great success story. Well <laughs> Thank done. You. Thanks. Uh, that's, yeah, that's really inspirational, actually. <laughs> uh, that makes me feel great. Uh, was there any, was there any tough times? There was a few, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll share one other thing that I haven't shared before. But, um... Yeah, you know, art was tough. Art, I'm a terrible artist, um, and, like, I'm able to kind of describe the funny thing and maybe give you, like, a terrible stick figure doodle, mm -hmm. but um, we ended up um, working with a company that was, you know, generous enough, generous enough to work with us um, kind of out of house, um, like an art studio, and um, that's, that's challenging, given that the rest of us are all here in the room and we can, you know, chat to one another, we're kind of in each other's brains a little bit because we're, we're so unified by the same goal. Um, it's nothing about the specific art vendor in particular, but working with somebody um, doing your art non-house, it's just very different. Mm -hmm. uh, timelines don't always match, you know, priorities don't always match. And um, yeah, it can just, it took a lot more um, effort than I thought it would. And um, a lot, a lot of like stressing, a lot of stressing. Did, uh, did you have some kind of per, uh, like perception into how that was, oh, that, was that system that works, works based, based on where based you on came from? Um, I did actually, yeah. Um, myself and uh, one of the gents, one of the Daves who works with me. Um, uh, one of the Daves. The Daves. What? What? Um, yeah, both worked from really their creative studios where we, yeah, um, you know, the post production place. And so yeah, you know, we're used to working with an art director and a bunch of production artists and designers and things. And in this case, it's kind of like I I'm always the programmer and maybe the UI guy until now. But suddenly, you know, I guess I'm the designer and I'm sharing design duties with um with artists and and now you're yeah, contracting out artists. Exactly. So it's it's really interesting for me. It was a learning process for sure to be able to not just you know doodle the code and wait for the art to come, but to be able to really eloquently describe what it is we want. And you know, for example. Especially in our game, okay, we need a ninja, but sometimes we want something really slapsticky and funny and dumb, and sometimes we're, we're kind of being deadly serious at the moment. And so being able to sketch and communicate that well is, uh, is something I've definitely had to learn. Wow. That's also a, a very different uh, 
I guess, building strategy. Uh, we yesterday had an interview with Arden, Arden. and Arden Ripley, uh, she was developing based on uh, just grabbing friends. Mm-hmm. So it was like a, a very different economy. Uh, yeah. And a very, very interesting ways that those uh, do the same things, but from very different paths. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, like, obviously, having worked at, at the previous creative studio, like, I'm friends with a lot of artists whose work I really admire and respect. People, I mean, um, a friend of ours from that place, uh, Irving, did the box art that you see on Steam, and I, which I love. It's an actual painting. It's amazing. But um, just the nature of our game with five uh, art styles that all need to be kind of style guide different. You know, it's so important to me that you'd be able to look at a dimensional bubble ahead of you and not have to react to turning into a ninja, but to be able to look ahead and know, okay, that's ninja space. And so it wasn't good enough to just have a different style of tree or something, but we really wanted to have like one world be watercolor, one world be 8-bit, one world be flash art, stuff like that. And so there's so much need for so many different talent and so many assets that um, I, I don't know how, I salute uh, their art. I don't know how they got on top of it. Oh, that's amazing, man! Every time you, every I mean, think I think the thing that's getting me so tripped up over specifically concursion, and I'm not usually I someone who's at a loss for awesome words, word. <laughs> is that like every time you can just say ninja space, and like have that mean have something that in such a <laughs> like ludological way. Uh, I'm just looking at concursion, and I'm just like, this is like game studies 101. <laughs> yeah. Game. Yeah. Uh, this is like so metaphysical in its philosophies and how it works, oh, it works. uh <laughs> just amazing <laughs> <laughs> thank you yeah it's, it's a ton of fun to build and like you know that's how i know i'm happy with it it's still a ton of fun to play mm-hmm. for me which it shouldn't yeah. be by all rights because there's so much there's five different forms of play that are being uh enacted on on the fly I, by the command I, of the player uh is just is just brilliant and elegant and i can see how, see how this should be a, such a successful, successful product, product and game thing. and fun thing thank you so much yeah i think it's probably the only game that has an achievement stated as do eight double jumps in the air without touching a wall or becoming an engine <laughs> that last part yeah. <laughs> oh i became an engine Oh, I'm a spaceship. I lose. Aww. Kill the game where you can lose an achievement for becoming a spaceship. <laughs> uh, wow. I'm just absolutely gobsmacked. Uh, Thanks. How has, how has things been going as far as after you developed the game? You know, it's it's mysterious and terrifying literally we're seven days old right now yeah. and so i had no idea like this is my first ever game okay. for we're everyone eight on days old <laughs> right nice so ah, oh, you're you can't lick my older brother yeah no not um, at all you you have months on us if you steal my toys i'm gonna tell mom we've only been public for four days so I'm that's still true younger. <laughs> well yeah i had no idea what to expect i've never shipped a game not not on my own certainly and so it was like day one do we get five sales 50 500 like is that awesome is that bad and so um yeah it's really exciting to see you know people showing up on the leaderboards people playing it it's you know especially the night before launch i was just like stressing and, and like i don't really stress but i was really aware of it it's like i don't know what to do with myself i'm gonna go to bed that's amazing yeah. uh so now that it's out and it's been out for five days, uh, but it's been, been it's been in development for a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, did you show it off at places, or what did you do to kind of get the word out there? Um. Well, we've well, we're talking to you. That's, big, that's big, for sure. Probably, honestly, one of the biggest parts. But um, yeah, no, just reaching out to people, talking about it is a really big part. Um, uh, we actually um in the most recent months um hooked up i'm gonna drop their name because they deserve it Uh, but there's a company called beef jack and they do promotions for indie games and um i came across them because they had worked on several games that i just really respected and had heard of and seemed kind of weird in the same way that our was like gameplay weird and so um beef jack we ended up giving a call and they i don't know how to market but they do um so yeah it's for example, it's shocking to me, but we are in PC Gamer this month. We have a page in PC Gamer, and that's like mind-blowing to me. I can't imagine that something like that would have been true 30 days ago. 
I would never have guessed or imagined it. So you, you like did it. You were like, uh, made a one of every single kind of arcade game. <laughs> uh, combined them all into one single game, shipped it in a year, and now we're going into PC Gamer. Indeed. Yes. And then Infinity and Beyond. And then you interviewed it in D3. It's like, dude, this is tons of fun. Come on. This has been, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like E3. It's kind of like off brand E3. Yeah. Well, so I'll tell you, I was at E3 this week. <gasps> tell me about and, it. Is it a dream? Ooh, it's this giant monolithic towers of video games looking down on you and <laughs> smiling, beaming rays of sunshine into your heart. Um, that was a crazy one for me. Like, I live in L.A., so I go to E3 most years. But this year it was like, you know, laptop on my back, guerrilla warfare, just marketing. Hey, have you heard about, hi, my name's Danny. Can I tell you about? And, uh, yeah, it's, it was a very different experience. Still a lot of fun. Got to play some games. But uh, very sore at the end of the day. Looking the laptop around. Yeah, two laptops in my backpack. Laptop in the cardboard box that you put it on. When What's you, right? when you need to play it for someone, you just set it down. And like, here's a laptop, and then tell people to go. Yeah, well, exactly. Play this, you will like well, it. I'll tell you, though, the Indie, Indie 3 stuff you've been doing this week has been some of my favorite part of the week. Absolutely, that's true. Like, um, I, I'm going to fail to reference the person's name, but I was watching um, a music panel last night, or maybe it was the night before, where somebody was kind of showing their music program as they were playing songs and kind of uh, curating the uh, soundtrack. And it was just, the music was genuinely great, but I loved I'm talking about where it came from, how they made was, it, and was, you know, watching go by. That was amazing. Cool stuff. Thank you. You can talk more about that all day if you'd like. <laughs> sure. Uh, no, uh, I want to get back to concursion, though. Of course. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do you have any like links into like game studies or anything like that, or have you worked in like where are you philosophically coming from on a design <laughs> level? Because this seems like so advanced. I am really, really interested in kind of how games work, but both at the technical level, like I, I've talked people's heads off just about like hitboxes for Street Fighter, but yes, but in, in gameplay you. mechanics, um, you know, I I found myself drawn more and more lately in recent years to you know consuming tons of games, especially like indie games, and not necessarily beating them, and that doesn't by any means I enjoy them any less. It's actually the opposite. Like I'll play and dig in, really get a, like an understanding for how this game works, what makes it tick. And just like, and I'm hungry for more, and I want to see like the next game and how that works. And so that's that's kind of become an odd way that I'm consuming a ton of games in recent years. So what's next then? Are you going to combine racing and fighting games? Ooh, literally, we're going to have people hanging out the passenger side door, just like slapping at each other, <laughs> and and then turtle shells from behind. <laughs> Um, you know what? The, the plan is um, next week, or it's going to be the first week off in a year. It's going to be the first day off in a year. So we released E3 Indie 3 week, and then uh, we're all going to go home and take a long, long nap. And uh, the Monday following, I've got some uh, gameplay ideas drafted up, but we're all going to come back with our own ideas and um, kind of smash them against each other and decide what game number two looks like. Oh, wow. Just a week. Well, <laughs> just... Uh, a week break, and then then we'll start smashing ideas. Wow, you guys are just ready. You're so excited. Well, I, I won't speak. I hope I'm not like slave driver, but yeah. For speaking for me, I just this is why I wanted to you know quit being a grown up and do this. I love programming and making and playing games, so uh, I'm sure by the end of the week I'll be hungry to get back to it. You gonna gonna do? You gonna take part in any game jams or anything? You know, now that we have a chance to do it, if one's coming up soon, uh, definitely. It's for the last year. It's been so heads down on this. Yeah, there might be some room to explore a couple of things using that. Yeah, I'm definitely. Uh, that was a highlight of E3 for me this year, actually, is the IndieCade section. Oh, awesome. uh, all these really cool games that, like, a lot of them are huge, blow-off, amazing, and beautiful. But some of them are also just, like, brilliant ideas executed in 48 hours. And um, it's, it's inspiring to see. It's, it's exactly the kind of stuff I like to play. That's what we've been seeing too on this side of things is just so many jam games that are so impressive and then yeah. even more they are built on afterwards. Oh, can I can I respond to chat just cuz I see a really interesting chat please, comment? Please, I can't see chat so uh Oh, I've got it on my other at, computer. Uh please and uh speak it out fully so that I can hear it too and then Sure. Well, 
So minimally writes, honestly, the immediate damsel in distress in the trailer for this game put me off. Totally cool with that. Here's why I bring it up. That is not going to go anywhere that you expect it to go. Level 1, 2, and 3, very intentional homage to a story that you are very, very familiar with. We're, like I said, for the gameplay, we're using a lot of tradition to establish how to play. For the story, we're using a lot of tradition to establish a world. I guarantee that's not going where you expect it will. And I can't say more without plot spoilers, but it makes me giggle. <laughs> So you, you are attempting to subvert the trope, at least. Yes, we are very consciously exploiting and subverting that trope. Um, by, by the time you're halfway through, uh, I think you'll see where we're going. And by the time you're through, um, we are very consciously painting a lampshade on that trope. I'm just trying to think. Uh, you, I'm going with the themes of concursion. I can only expect that exactly. you are the princess, are the princess. and the villain. <laughs> And uh, you are evoked in all of these spaces, just, you know, scattered between all of the worlds at once. So, you know, that makes sense, right? It is all the dream of a princess imagining the worlds that could have been if she weren't so often kidnapped. <laughs> uh, um, that's, all, that's that's a fantastic all. question, though, too, because uh, that is something I think a lot of people were thinking about when they first see that trailer. Mm -hmm. I'm also pretty sure I saw the, the princess show up as a knight in armor. <laughs> to like yeah. save you at some point in that trailer yeah that, that's our uh that's harmony she's uh, she was a uh, handmaiden of the princess and ah. she is the most loyal adventurer in that land um you know we've got a history of saving the princess as well as the hero but uh when bad gets to worse she's she's the go-to hero really that's brilliant well um yeah any more questions in the chat yeah. anyone else have any things that they want to say because uh, i'd love to help uh, chat get their voice out too because they've been so great this week. Definitely. Also, uh, shout outs to the chat because um, a, lot a lot of our, lot panelists, of our panelists, panelists and interviewees and people have been getting back to us back about us. How, how, how fun it was to be a part of this and how engaging chat has been all week and amazing. Uh, so thank you for that. This is neat because because you asked for chat, but chat's just like a minute behind, or like we're a minute behind. So I don't know if they've heard us ask yet. Oh, oh. So I sound like an awesome guy. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody says that's not a question. Try again. I like that question. I want that question all the time. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for the comments, though. Yeah. Uh, no, thank you very much. This is tons of fun. Seriously. Whoop, pulling up the developer console. Thanks, Chrome. Um, so yeah, so, yeah. In, in, with lack of I any more questions, questions. Um, uh, we you can get yeah. Incursion right now on Steam. It is a baby. It is five days five old. Days old. And <laughs> it's, that's right, yeah. It's, it's a newborn. Yes, it's it's yeah, five six days old. Yeah, that's so cool. Uh, so yeah, it just came out, and uh, unless you have any more announcements or anything, I think uh, that about wraps up the interview. Well, thanks for having me on. It really was a pleasure. Um, I'm definitely going to hang out in the chat and you to consume in D3, so thanks very much. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> um, yeah, Concursion, everyone. Everyone, go, go. Is there links in the chat to Concursion in Steam? There will be shortly if there's not that. All right. Not now. Thank you so much, guys. Um, so what is the plan now, dear James? Um, um, you tell me. Do we want to run more Indie Showcase? Let's see, what is on the docket? Yep. I'm playing uh, up the schedule now. Currently, we have more Indie Showcase to show off, and then we have a panel coming up at 6, so that we can get uh, some okay. time to eat. Okay, so in that case, let's run Indie Showcase until 6, at which point we will have the Indie Game Right podcast here. We will take an intermission at that point up until the 8 o'clock performance of Centris. Yes. All right. Thank you, Danny. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. I forgot that I wasn't a touchscreen to unmute. Thanks again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you again, and everybody, go, go check out Concursion. It looks amazing. Five minutes. All right. Yep, we will take a five-minute break and then come back with the next round of Indie Showcase. Right on.